Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXJS Weekly, episode number 100. First of all, before we get started with the whole, you know, news and articles and everything, let me just say thank you to, well, everyone who supports me, everyone who watches me, listens to me, chats with me on the Discord. Hey, um, really appreciate it. You guys are basically what keeps me going. So thank you very much for your support over all these years, actually, now. I've been, I've been doing this for quite a while. So yes, here is to, I guess, another 100 episodes, at least, maybe even more. Let's see how that develops. But okay, uh, now we are going back to the episode itself. So we got... Quite a few things today, um, not as big as it used to be, at least in the last year, but you know, I guess a uh, year is still kind of starting, so we don't really have that many things, but we do have some really cool articles today. So first, as usual, we got the getting started section. Uh, we got three things here today. The first one is the CSS cascade or how browsers resolve competing CSS styles. And it's essentially a very um, entry level guide, like getting started one, right? That explains how exactly the browsers handle the CSS and how they figure out which style is more important than the other so that you don't have to throw in the important bit. Um, now, first of all, I just want to note this sidebar that is absolutely amazing. So this site navigation is really, really cool. And I think it just, you know, you should look at it just for that because this looks really awesome. Um, other than that, if you are just getting started and if you are not familiar with CSS, then definitely give it a read. It does a very well, uh, like a uh, really good job of explaining how does the CSS, um, imp uh, no, not importance. I guess importance is the right word as well. How the CSS priorities are assigned within the browser, right? So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Again, I would just look at it and inspect the source just for the site menu because it's absolutely awesome. <laughs> But uh, that's my opinion. All right. Next article we got here is why the TypeScript team is using Gatsby for its new websites. Uh, now, this is, again, the pretty high level. And on the other hand, the sort of getting started article, because this is a write-up on Gatsby blog. But it is from the one of the engineers that work on a TypeScript at Microsoft. And this outlines why TypeScript team switched to Gatsby for the new website that they have. Uh, they used to use Jekyll, but now it's Gatsby. And this post basically outlines the reasoning. So if you were considering Gatsby and if you were thinking, hey, maybe I should switch to it, then this is absolutely the post for you. It does a really good job of outlining why Gatsby is cool. Again, you know, if you haven't seen my streams, uh, go watch it because I think I did a pretty good job showing it off. Um, if you just want to read, then go ahead and look at that because it does have all the sort of major points, major advantages of Gatsby outlined. And that's basically it. All right, and the last article we got here is from the V8 dev blog. And this one is actually really, really cool. So it's called Understanding the ECMAScript Spec Part 1. And it's basically a tutorial on how to read the spec and understand the notation that it has, because it is essentially a completely different language from, you know, what you would expect by reading even the technical documentation because it's a specification. So there is a lot of very specific things that might be very confusing at first. So what this article does is basically takes some bits of spec and walks you through them, uh, dissecting what any of those things that the spec mentions mean, because there's like quite a few, quite a bit of things like, you know, the abstract operations, internal slots, internal methods, and so on and so forth. So if you ever wanted to read um, ECMAScript spec, but were really confused about the whole wording they use, the, the terms and so on and so forth, get started here. This is a really, really good starting point. So um, yeah, that's basically it for the get started. Um, next section as usual is articles and news. We got three things here. All three of them are actually really, really cool. So the first one is, um, an article called Building your, your First Neuro App with React. And it talks about building the app that is based off the reading the cognitive state of your mind. So reading the, uh, what do you call them? Not the ECG device. Is it? Is, no, no, ECG is the heart, right? What is the, uh, when you read the waves? Uh, oh man, the brainwave thingy. <laughs> I completely forgot the name for that. So ECG is the heart one and there's a bunch of devices out there that are, you know, basically are kind of consumer grade right now. 
and they allow you to read the brain waves and i forgot the scientific name for that for whatever reason do they have it here they don't seem to have it oh, man how could i forget that uh, blah 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 okay you know what whatever so it basically allows you to read the brain waves right and this is the new fancy uh startup from uh i think it was where was there was a mention here it was the guy who left tesla or something hello far i remember reading about that somewhere but essentially it's a startup that uh creates a new device that is like super sensitive super high quality it's called notion and it allows you to read the brain waves right eg right kevin thank you very much and welcome to the stream <laughs> i knew it was e something but oh man okay Anyway, so you can read EEG with this thing. It's not yet available. You can only uh, get to the wait list, but this blog post is from the CTO of the company and it show, uh, shows you how to use JavaScript and React on the web, which is uh, pretty damn impressive, to create a WebGL ocean that is controlled by your brainwaves. And um, I've played around with a couple of devices like this and usually the SDKs they have are really clunky or really low level as in you get, you know, like a set of random data. And unless you are a neuroscientist, you will have no idea what the shit do you see here. Now, um, Neurosity, on the other hand, seems to have a really nice SDK. So the article itself starts with like, okay, let's build a basic React form. You log in with your Notion um api credentials and then you basically get access to the notion api which i guess is tied to your account and then we just render the basic ocean and then there comes this notion api um or notion sdk i guess right and um the way it works is it uses subscription so i'm guessing it's something like websockets so you will have some sort of a delay right because the device first has to connect to the internet send the data to the server server will then send it to any consumers that are out there, right? But uh, seems like the delay is negligible essentially because you know the whole like neurosciences and neural neural interfaces are still very much work in progress. So do not expect any immediate responses. But the API are actually super straightforward. So there's the ocean on the screen right now. This is like very basic ocean that the um, author just you know picked somewhere up. So there's the uh, the link for the original thing. And the idea is that you basically tie in the calmness of the ocean to calmness of your brain. So the more intensively you think, the more intensively your uh, EEG will, um, I guess, I don't know, what's the right word here? Ampl no, not amplify. Change, change the amplitude, I guess, right? And then you can tie this to the simulation of the ocean and change the choppiness, wind and the size of it. Now, the cool thing is that the whole Notion API is literally just like, okay, subscribe to calmness, and then you got the probability of calmness. So they even have, it's basically, you know, not as low level as what I've seen before. It actually gives you some pre-existing, I guess it's based on machine learning. So it actually tries to predict how calm is the user, which is really cool. So um, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of the gist of it. It's a really interesting article and I would personally love to get my hands on something like this and to play around with it to see what can I actually do with that because the neural interfaces is a really interesting area. I have no idea how much they will advance in, you know, next few years because that's totally not my area of uh, expertise, but um, they definitely look really, really cool. And uh, this one is, yeah, it looks like they are finally get doing this step you know of not just giving you the low level data of like alpha beta gamma brainwaves and then you basically have to figure out what the hell is that yourself being a neuroscientist i guess and give you a more high level interface that will abstract things for you and just give you an api to think like hey there this is the user calmness which is actually really cool so if that sounds interesting do check out the uh, article they do have the repo on github with all the code as I said before, again, unfortunately, you cannot really get the device right now. So they only have the waiting list. And I, I'm guessing it's going to be released sometime this year. But we're going to see. Uh, Neurosity, if you're watching me, send me your device. I will test it for you. I will do a stream for you. <laughs> totally after that, um, that would be a really fun project to do, actually. But um, yeah, there we go. All right. 
Next article we got here is old CSS, new CSS. Now, this is probably my favorite one from this week. So um, it's a really big article, as you can see here, like it's very, very long and there's a lot of text here. But essentially it's a history of CSS development from like 90s until today. And uh, I mean, by CSS development, I mean, you know, even the States when the first browsers didn't even have any CSS, right? So CSS was not a thing and you had like, attributes for tags that you would use to style things and there was i don't know what was it 216 safe colors on the web that you could use and stuff like this and yeah there's a link to space jam website that is still exists and still works uh, for some reason for me i think it couldn't load for whatever reason maybe the article killed it or something but there are screenshots here. It looks very much 90s. And it's absolutely amazing to see it's, it, it being dissected. So you have the table markup, which I still remember doing that at some point. <laughs> like that was a thing. And in, in, even even at the, I think at the beginning of 2000s, I was still using that because I was really bad at, at doing markup. But uh, yeah, so and then, you know, progressing from the table markups, going to the very basic early days of CSS, the dark times, as the author says, of CSS2 with uh, billions of browser, you know, like problems with CSS essentially, then going into the browser wars and subsequent stagnation when the CSS just basically wasn't changed for years and JavaScript as well, actually, is the interesting bit. Going into the quirks modes, uh, XHTML that I, I believe it was Microsoft who was actually trying to push that at a time and, you know, to create kind of what the React does now with JSX, right? So the idea was that you, the HTML is pretty loose, right? So it's based on SGML syntax and nobody knows what's that and nobody knows what the grammar that is. Uh, but the idea was to introduce the XHTML, which basically would be all or nothing. So the same way React works right now, right? If you make even slightest mistake, nothing would render and browser will just show you the error. So the same way again, JSX works right now. Uh, that never took off for some reason. Um, there's an explanation here as well. And, uh, you know, then CSS layout starting with floats and divs going into the basic grids. DHTML, I remember learning about that. I had uh, some, what was the book's name? I remember buying a book about that in like early 2000s was like, hey, uh, we have like dynamic HTML, the new fancy thing that will kill the flash. And... Um, yeah, it took quite a few years to do that, but uh, it was it was quite interesting. So you could do like fancy menus and stuff, something that uh, usually was done using like Adobe Flash, you know, embeds that would be like complete menu just in Flash. That's what I remember doing as well. And then everything else would essentially uh, tie into that menu. And then he was able finally to do that with dynamic HTML which still wasn't as fancy as Flash, but was a thing. And yeah, then we're going to the Web 2.0 with Firefox and ACID tests and everything. And, you know, end of era of CSS hacks. And then there's the prefixes and then there's the modern era. Uh, basically, if you are interested in the history of CSS, absolutely read through that. Even if you're not, just go ahead and read through this. It's very well written. It's very easy to read. It's very entertaining. And uh, what I want to highlight uh, additionally is aside from the whole like history and uh, the list of what we have right now, actually, which when you look at it, you know, when you try to remember what you were doing like 20 years ago, it is just so much better. Um, but aside from all of that, there is actually a very interesting bit here. So there is an additional section on uh, things, uh, basically the things that were never added to CSS. It's called some futures that never were. And there is some things I've never even heard about, which is just insane. Like there are some of them um, sound actually pretty cool, but I can see how they can be very problematic. But anyway, like the whole thing is brilliant. And if you are doing web development, just, just, you know, just find 20 minutes, 15 minutes and go and read this article. It's absolutely amazing. All right, um, and the last article we got here for today for the article section is a new responsive technique for making, uh, sorry, a new technique for making responsive JavaScript free charts. So this is an article from Rich Harris. Uh, he is the author of Svelte and also prior to, you know, creating Svelte and a bunch of other things, 
Um, he's been working for quite some years in uh, New York Times, and he's been doing the data visualization there. So this is actually why I followed him initially, Pressweld, and he's been doing some really cool libraries for visualization and writing some really cool articles about how they do it at New York Times. And this time around, he does a write up on how to do the responsive charts using SVG. And you, you might think, you know, like, what's the, what's the problem with making them responsive with SVG? I mean, SVG is already responsive, so you can just scale it any way you want and it will lose any quality, right? Quality, yes. On the other hand, it will actually distort the data and this is something not you want. And um, basically the article is talking specifically about that, about scaling the charts responsively in a way that doesn't really distort how the data looks. So the naive scaling obviously looks like this and well, that doesn't really look good, right? And then he goes into the um, outlines, basically, what could you do to make this look properly, which is essentially using the uh, basic HTML and CSS to um, sign the axis and then just using SVG for the chart itself. By the way, I did know that uh, doing chart from SVG was that easy. And uh, it also has the Swell the Pancake, so it's now part of Swell itself. It's a new library for drawing charts like this that basically does everything for you. So you just have to use it, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So if you're working with Welt or if you're working with charts a lot and you wanted to have um, responsive SVG charts that are can be server side rendered, don't need any JavaScript, then definitely do have a look at that. It is absolutely awesome. A really cool approach and a very easy one as well. So yeah, there we go. All right. That is it for the articles in use. Now we got tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. So we got a few interesting things here. Uh, like the first one is this article from Asset Note. Uh, it's called Expanding the Attack Surface React Native Android Apps. And um, it's a deep dive into the common React Native applications uh, that are published on Android and that have some problems with them. Now, I never thought about it because I never actually published an app that would have any security keys in it. But if you publish an Android app, right, using React Native, and if you bundle any security keys within your JavaScript, anyone who unpackages your APK can actually just grab those keys from your source code, right? Because React Native doesn't really obfuscate anything. It doesn't package anything. It doesn't encrypt anything. So it's very easy to just unpackage that APK, go into the app, and there you go. There is your keys, right? So I like it's it's very obvious when you think about that, but uh, you know this is not something I even thought about. But it's definitely an attack vector. And if you are building Android apps, then definitely like React Native Android apps, obviously, then definitely think about that and think what you can do uh, to disallow ripping the keys off in such an easy way, right? Uh, there's obviously the encrypted storage and stuff like this for Android that you can use to actually store that. So, you know, do that instead and maybe use even the native bit of the app because React Native does give you interop with the native code, right? But uh, yeah, it's an interesting attack vector that I never thought about. And I imagine a lot of React Native actually suffer from it. I'm, I'm, I would guess most of them actually, but there you go. All right, uh, next thing we got here is report what's new in ECMAScript and JavaScript for 2020. So this is a very nice summary of uh, essentially, first of all, what came in ECMAScript 2019, which was uh, last year. And I think we talked about it more than a few times already. And then the more interesting, what is coming in ECMAScript 2020 and what looks like it's gonna make it in 2020, because I mean, you know, we still have a few months until ECMAScript meeting, uh, I believe it was like in June or something. And there's quite a few proposals that could get to stage three or four before that and could be approved for the ECMAScript 2020 by that time. And this article basically does a very good job of, um, you know, overview of what those might be, including stuff like extended imports, promise settled all, big decimals, big ints, coalescing and chaining and stuff like this. So if you're interested in tracking the spec, uh, basically check this one out. It's a pretty good summary. Okay. Next thing is announcement from uh, ECMAScript committee, the decimal numbers, a uh, big decimal just made it to stage one. So you will finally be able to do um, proper comparison of 0 0.1 with 0 0.2, which equals 0 0.3 in this case. So it's not 
IEEE, uh, what was it, 734, I think, right? And it's going to be like the decimal numbers, not the floating point ones, which work the way you expect them to. So uh, maybe people will finally stop bashing JavaScript for that. <laughs> but it's pretty cool, actually, to see something like this making it into spec. Uh, but there we go. Right, uh, next thing we got here is uh, HTML's Q element, which I didn't even know existed, to be honest. So it turns out there is a Q element that is locale aware and, uh, uh, let me try this again. So it's a locale aware quotes that nest correctly. As in, if you wrap, you know, one quotes into another, it will figure out correctly how to format them based on user's locale. Um, which is actually really cool. And I remember how much I suffer when we try to localize stuff and we had to basically do the quoted lines for every language, which was annoying as hell. So um, there you go. Uh, now you know as well. Right, next thing we got here is uh, CSS media query prefers reduced data. Again, something I did not know existed, but turns out it actually is there. It is only a proposal for now, but it actually makes a lot of sense and um, allows you to, yeah, so user basically user's device allows to uh, allows user to say that, okay, he prefers to reduce data. So you can actually swap things like background images or disable fonts, uh, you know, web fonts and things like this, which makes perfect sense. Like, I don't know why this was not included <laughs> into CSS earlier because this is just great. Like this is this is absolutely great proposal. If that sounds interesting, there's proposals, specs, and everything. Do check it out. It looks pretty damn cool. Okay. Last thing we got here for today in the tips and tricks is React libraries in 2020. This is essentially a collection of uh, links related to well anything uh, you can do in React, basically starting from state management and routing and going into desktop apps, mobile apps, VR, AR, and Essentially, the whole ecosystem, uh, the most popular libraries in each category. So if you're working with React or if you're considering starting with it or if you're looking for the most popular libraries in different categories, then do check this one out. It has almost everything, like almost like this. There's, there's a lot of them. But anyway, OK, um, that is it for tips, tricks and bit sized awesomeness. Now we are coming to the releases section we do have quite a few here. So uh, the first major release of the week is Electron 8, which updates the Chromium to version 80 and V8 to version 8.0 and Node.js to version 12.13, which means we're, Electron is now basically uh, up to speed with both no, uh, Node.js and Chrome to basically, you know, the latest stable versions. I mean, Node.js, obviously they are using LTS. Uh, I don't know if, if it makes sense for them to go to the like bleeding edge because it's probably going to break things. But uh, this is pretty exciting. So there's some breaking changes as usual. This is why it's major version. So make sure to check this one out. But because it uses Chrome 80 and uh, V880, this means you can use stuff like uh, Nullish Coalescing or Optional Chaining natively without any Babel or stuff like this. So that's uh, that's pretty great. Do check it out. Next thing we got here is IXJS version 3.0, uh, the new release here with uh, importable operators. So they are migrating to the same way that RxJS is working right now, which makes perfect sense. And then there's the, uh, you could you can still extend the operators with prototype to make it work the same way it did before. But you know, I think this way, <clears throat> apologies, this way is probably a lot nicer especially once we get the pipeline operator into the language itself, uh, which I mean, I'm just hoping they will finish it later. Uh, sorry, sooner, not later. Uh, I know that there's like competing proposals and everything, but uh, it just can't come soon enough. But anyway, I think CS is really cool if you're working with uh, poolable, iterable, so do check it out. All right. Next major release of the week we got here is React Navigation 5.0. This is, um, it looks like they're completely rewritten it from the ground up. Uh, it no longer uses uh, any functions or wrappers or whatever, and now uses pure components and hooks for everything, which looks a lot slicker than it was before. I mean, it was a nice leap to work with even before, but now it just looks a lot slicker and, you know, more reacty, I guess. 
So if you are building React Native apps and you were looking for the navigation library, this one is actually really, really good. I've used it in a couple of projects and can quite highly recommend it. Now that sounds interesting, do check it out. All right, next release we got here is VS Code January release version 1.42. It got a lot of improvements. Uh, most of them are like quality of life. Uh, there's rename previews, open editors limit, place uh, panel placements. All of those are fine and everything, but there's one change that is mentioned only briefly somewhere. I don't even remember what is mentioned, but this is my personal highlight. So there's the um, saving thing. Save, where is save con? No, that's not, not the conflict resolution. Ha yeah, there you go. Handling slow save operation. So uh, the problem with VS Code, uh, the way it's, used to do the whole like, you know, pre-tier formatting or whatever, format and save, fix on save, is that it allocated the specific time frame for any script to save, to format things, right? So you would, if you have a really big file and pre-tier took longer than X milliseconds, what VS Code did, it just killed it off and then saved the file as is, which was annoying, right? So sometimes pre-tier would work, other times it would just fail and you would be like, ah, oh, come on, I have to like format this stuff. It was annoying. Now what they did is they changed that behavior. So now instead of uh, doing that, killing it off, it actually runs it asynchronously and shows you this message running safe participants and then shows you specific plugin script or whatever is running in the backend and gives you a way to manually cancel that if you want to, which is just so much nicer. No longer you have to like sit and wait for, you know, like, oh, will Prettier work this time around or not on my like, you know, thousand line file or whatever, which yeah, could have been annoying as hell. Uh, but that's my personal highlight. There's a, as usual a ton more uh, changes and updates. So again, VS Code, my favorite thing. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. Right, uh, next thing we got here is Angular version nine release. Project Ivy is finally there. It is now included uh, into the, or I guess enabled by default. And uh, seems like the upgrade path uh, to version nine is actually automated. So what I heard from the people in our Discord server is that you can literally run the command line command and it will upgrade the project for you and just, you know, let you test it see if everything works and you're done, which is um, actually really awesome. So if you're using Angular, make sure to check it out. Seems like there's a whole ton of improvements with regards to bundle sizes, speeds, uh, styling, checking errors, and so on and so forth. So definitely seems like it's worth checking out. And uh, yeah, it's like, like this chart, for example, is super impressive. So they, they claim up to 40% uh, decrease in size for a very large apps, which is damn impressive. So there you go. All right, uh, next release we got here is Chrome version 80. So this has just been released this week. I think it was like Tuesday or something. And uh, um, Microsoft Edge has also updated to version 80. So they seem to be using the same numbering as the Chrome, which is uh, perfectly fine. And what comes in is uh, actually quite a lot of exciting features. Like you can finally use modules and workers. So you can now say that the worker is type module and you will be able to use imports and import anything you want. Optional chaining is here. So yes, you can now finally use the optional chaining syntax right in a browser in without any additional compilation, which is pretty damn cool. And there's a bunch of other minor changes. So if you are interested, do check it out. But uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool in my opinion. All right, uh, next thing we got here is TypeScript version 3.8 RC with uh, type only imports and exports, ECMAScript private field support, finally. Export star as namespace syntax, top level await support, which is also really cool and a bunch of other minor changes. So, you know, if you're using TypeScript, do check it out. I've, I've started using TypeScript since I've started playing around with Deno because it just makes it so easy that basically it doesn't matter if you write JavaScript or TypeScript. And in most cases, I actually found it to be quite nice. So, you know, might as well try to switch to it sometime. Okay. Last release we got here, or actually releases, is a Node.js February security releases. So this is, um, Security updates for all three versions of Node, the 8 LTS, no wait, 10 LTS, 12 LTS, and 13, which is the latest one. And they basically fix, 
<coughs> apologies they fix the critical and high uh, profile cves uh, in them so if you are running any of those in production make sure to upgrade um, you can see all the details on the link as usual there's like yeah those seem pretty severe so make sure to update your node versions okay that is it for leases now we are coming to the libs and demos we don't really have that many of them here but uh, some interesting ones are uh, this week around and uh, yeah the first one we got here is size limits uh, which allows you to calculate the real cost to run your javascript app or lib to keep the good performance and allows you to show the errors when you exceed the given uh, limit so basically it's you can run it in ci for example to control the size of your dependency and then you know throw or error out if it gets too big which can be quite damn useful so if that sounds interesting do check it out Right, next thing we got here is Node Notifier, a node modules for sending notifications on native Mac, Windows, and Linux, or Grohl as fallback. So <clears throat> if you are uh, working with, well, anything, and you want to send notifications for some reason, including the ones like, you know, the reach ones on Mac, for example, I'm not sure the Windows actually supports stuff like this, but uh, yeah, this script allows you so I've seen the use cases like, you know, if you have a very long running background script and you just want to get the notification uh, that it's finished, you can do something like this. And the API is incredibly easy. So yeah, there you go. That's basically all it does. Right. Uh, next thing we got here is uh, GLTF JSX. So this is, this is a really unique one. Uh, it's a thing that turns gltfs into jsx components you never heard about gltf it's a format for 3d um no not great lake theaters so it's a format for um 3d scenes and models that uses json and it's gl transmission format and you can basically export models from 3d editors into that right so this thing uses uh, react 3 fiber to load the model and then expose it as a React component. And there is, so it's now version 1.0 because before that it was like in testing and everything, but uh, it basically allows you to do things like um, this. So you can export model, right? So this is Blender. Export this, save it, this is JSON now, and then you just run this thing. It compresses it, it optimizes it for the React, and then you can just import that model and then use it as a React component and it will render it in place wherever you do on your website for you, which is it's just absolutely bonkers. Like this is amazing. Uh, so yes, if you're working with 3D and if you wanted to, um, you know, use your 3D models on your website with React, now you can in like three commands, which is just insane. So there you go, GLTF JSX. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next thing we got here is OWL, the web framework for structured, dynamic, and maintainable applications, as the description says. Uh, it seems to be very similar to the way that React structures components, but for some reason, instead of just using functions, it uses extendable classes and static properties, which is a really weird architectural choice. I'm not sure why and you know like jsx even the like the htm library does the component embedding in my opinion just more intuitive right in this case it's like so you have to define the template and then you have to define a set of components as a static property like why i'm not sure but anyway it looks interesting so you know if you were looking for yet another ui library do check it out maybe this is exactly what you want again i'm not saying it's a bad decision i just it looks weird to me i did not have time to dive into it and figure out why did they do it this way but uh yeah it's just just a bit strange um okay continuing we got tempe a featherlight helper for javascript date formatting is just under two kilobytes and lets you format date in well any way you want right so it basically supports the formatting string and a locale and then formats the date uh, for whatever you want. Um, I don't see any browser support table, so I'm assuming it's probably using the 18N API and is only for the modern browsers. But anyway, you know, if you're coding for the evergreen stuff, then this looks pretty damn neat. Okay, 
Next thing we got here is bear test, an extremely fast and simple JavaScript test runner um, that yeah, it seems like it's it's aimed to be even simpler and faster than even tap, which is probably the most smallest, lightweight, simple, dumb test runner that I've ever seen. So yeah, if you wanted something smaller and faster, then do check it out. I mean, the API looked quite nice. I'm not sure why would you pick that over say tape or tap or, you know, I mean, Jest obviously is really advanced and slow, but again, you know, on modern machines is not that slow. So I don't know. But yeah, if you want it to be super small and super fast, then check this one out. Right, uh, next thing we got here is defu or defu, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a recursively assigned default properties. Uh, it's basically a library that allows you to um, extend the objects in a recursive manner. So you can assign the defaults from somewhere, which you know can be a bit of a pain and has to do manually. So this thing just um, optimizes it for you. That sounds interesting, do check it out. It is small-ish, like six kilobytes, not too bad and uh, just 500 bytes minified if you publish it. Uh, so there you go. Right, and the last thing we got here today is Venjur, a headless GraphQL e-commerce framework for the modern web, which is uh, something I don't think I've seen so far yet. So this, we already had like a bunch of headless GraphQL frameworks, but I think this is the first one that I've seen that is specifically tailored towards e-commerce, which uh, makes it quite a bit interesting. So if you're working with e-commerce platforms and, or maybe you're building them and you wanted to migrate to GraphQL backends, um, then do check this one out. I mean, it's, it's headless, so you can attach any UI you want. It's built with Nest and TypeScript and sort of build around ease of customization. Uh, looks like a really solid project. So, you know, uh, if you're working in that area, do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Right, uh, this is it for the libs and demos. The final thing we got here for today is the missing semester of your CS education. This is a set of lectures uh, from uh, uh, MIT. And it's essentially the overview of everything the, that you work with on a daily basis as a software developer, but that is for whatever reason not covered in universities, usually at least, right? So there's stuff like shell tooling and scripting, command line editors like Wim, data wrangling, command line environments, version control, debugging and profiling, meta programming, security and cryptography, and then uh, additional lecture on other things such as fuse, backups, APIs, VPNs, markdown, Docker, vagrants, all that kind of stuff, which is, uh, pretty damn impressive, to be honest. And they'll teach you how to quit WIM. Uh, that's actually a good question, is there? How do you quit WIM? Basics, escape, I... Yes, they teach you how to quit WIM. So <laughs> that's literally the first thing in the command line. <laughs> that's great, okay. They know their stuff. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, that's actually it for the episode 100. Um, so as I said in the description, I'm going to stay for like basically whatever time you guys want. If you have any questions that you want to ask me, throw them into the chat right now. Meanwhile, I will tell that you can find all the links that I've mentioned on uh, GitHub or bxjs.dev. Then we also have a Discord server that you can join to chat. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So if you guys have any questions about my work, about, uh, I don't know, whatever, bxjs, about YouTube, about Twitch, just just throw them into the chat. And uh, yeah, if not, then I don't know. I mean, I <laughs> don't really have any plans. Uh, you know what? I have, a, I have some plans. So I, I got in my hands on the new DLC for uh, Dead Cells. So uh, I'm going to stream that probably today later in the evening. Um, congrats on the 100 episodes. Thank you. As I, you know, I said, I said this in the beginning, but I'll just... Say it again, and I would not be here without all of you people watching and essentially encouraging me, giving your feedback. Um, I'm doing this because of you guys, so thank you very much for you know sticking around for 100 episodes and uh, giving me your feedback and telling me what you like and what you don't and discussing all this stuff with me on Discord. That's uh, always a fun time, in my opinion. So there you go. Okay, any more questions? Do you guys have, have anything you want to ask me? Been a pleasure watching your news overview. Well, thank you. Uh, again, you know, just 
highly appreciate all of that, uh, all the feedback, all the kind words. It's um, it's incredible to hear, to be honest. I did not expect that there will be so many people who want to hear me ramble about JavaScript. <laughs> 400 episodes, bear in mind. All right. Um, okay, so what do I do while you guys think about the question? 300 commits, by the way. Um, yeah, you know what? I can look. I can look at the statistics. We can look at the. We can look at the stats, right? So we can just go to the YouTube and Twitch and see what kind of, what kind of statistics. Oh man, I'm almost at seven thousand subscribers. Just, just thirty. Not enough. <laughs> okay. Um, is it possible to learn functional programming without a math background? Absolutely. Like I think. So like, if you want to go really hardcore in functional programming. And if you want to do something like Haskell, for example, right, then you will eventually have to learn mathematics, any, like at least some mathematical concepts anyway. But if you just want to, say, use JavaScript with functional programming on the very top level, then in most cases, just understanding of, you know, like what the monad is and what the monoid are, monoids and stuff like this, which is not really hard and in the most cases don't really require mathematical knowledge, if explained correctly. You can totally do that without mathematics. Um, again, you know, if you are gonna go like all hardcore and just go like, okay, okay, I'm gonna do like purely functional programming with, you know, the whole like mathematic notation on top of the functions, then yes, you have to know and understand that. But I personally, like I use, uh, so my style is kind of a mix between functional programming and object-oriented programming, right? And I tend to lean more towards the functional rather than object-oriented. And I, I've used like purely functional languages like Clojure and Haskell and a bunch of others just to figure out what it would like, what it would look like to write in purely functional manner. But I found that it sometimes is just too hard because it limits you. Like what I like in JavaScript is the fact that you can combine both, right? Because sometimes it's just easier to create an object and then throw it into the function and that's it basically. So unless you want to go like really, really, really hardcore on it, you don't really need math, uh, at least in my opinion, right? So I, I think I don't completely understand all the concepts. So if you take Haskell, and if you give me some like very, very uh, high level, like really good project in it, I would probably be lost for a few weeks because I would have to learn a lot of things about that, right? But um, again, in JavaScript, I don't think you need a lot of that. And most of the time it just comes down to correctly using functions and uh, you know stuff like partial application, carrying promises, and you can do that without knowing mathematics. That's kind of the gist of it. Um, yeah, um, any other questions? Anything else you guys want to ask about JavaScript, about software development? I don't know, like what, what I probably should, uh, why is there no link here? Wait a second, that is not right. There we go, <laughs> done. Uh, I probably should also switch the cast box to Anchor FM because I did migrate my podcast over here last time. I found you through the strappy video projects you did. How often do you do project streams? I also enjoy news. It seems nice to... Uh, yeah, so um, I try to stream every Wednesday. Uh, that has not been working out as of late, but I'm trying to get back to that. Essentially, Wednesday evenings, uh, Berlin time, usually around like 7 p.m. And uh, right now we're exploring Deno. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, Deno is still, you know, very much work in progress. So I'm feeling like we're going to wrap it up probably after the last stream. Uh, that's going to happen this Wednesday. And then, yeah, we'll just figure something else out, see what the whole hype uh, now is and pick something, a different library and try to figure that out. So I try, again, I try to do streams weekly. So new stream and one development stream not always works out. Uh, again, trying to back, trying to get back into the schedule. And uh, yeah, you know, happy to hear that you enjoy news. Uh, it's kind of fun to do as well. <laughs> okay, uh, let me think. It was BXGS Weekly, I think. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I need to update this. 
Uh, what are your thoughts about Deno? What are the advantages that I have over J? I mean, it is JavaScript. It's anyway, it's JavaScript anyway. Um, it does have the TypeScript, and but it's it's a Java it's a JavaScript runtime anyway, right? Wait a second. Let me just do this until I forgot. Uh, Encore FM. Did I mistype that? No, that looks correct. Uh, yeah. So Deno is JavaScript anyway, and uh, it's it's a logical evolution of Node.js, right? So because it's from the same author who came up, so Ryan Dahl, he came up with Node.js at one point in, what was it, 2009 or something. And now he sort of uh, outlined the evolution of it as Deno. And in my opinion, there is a lot of things that Deno does correctly. So like if... The biggest problem for me with Deno right now is absence of support, like it's absence of backwards compatibility essentially, right? So I cannot take my old existing Node.js project and migrate it to Deno because Deno, while well, Deno has the, technically it has the compatibility layer with Node, it's not there yet and it doesn't work with all the packages, which in my opinion holds it back. But probably, you know, once we get past version 1.0, the Deno is gonna be, so let me put it this way. I think that Deno is gonna replace Node at some point after 10 years, probably. Like if you don't count like, you know, the very like legacy projects that were built and shouldn't be touched and, and stuff like this. So I think as a mainstream tool, it's gonna replace Node at one point, but that's not gonna happen in the next like five, 10 years. But it is a really, really cool project. And I am very curious to see how that develops because I like a lot of the ideas. I like, I like the module resolution via URLs. Like that makes things a lot easier. Uh, it has downsides, obviously. Like, you know, I, I think I already talked about that. Uh, like the problem is that first of all, it's really cool that you can just import the module um, using the URL, right? And then it will handle everything else. Uh, the downside of that is that you don't have the centralized registry like NPM where you can find all the packages. So something will have to be created, some sort of a catalog. Like they have this third party modules thing, but um, the way it works right now is that if you write a Deno module and you wanna publish it here, you have to open the pull request to database.json with your stuff, which is, meh. You know, it's not, not as convenient as NPM publish. But I'm sure something will be created at one point. I'm sure this will be covered. And uh, I'm personally watching Dana closely. I'm very interested to see how, how it will develop. And I, I don't think I'm going to be dropping, you know, Node anytime soon. But uh, this is definitely a project to watch. Is basically what I'm trying to say. Right. Um, okay. So we did that. I updated that. We're fine. Okay. Um, any other questions? Any things you guys want to ask? Again, you know, I'm, I'm ready to take questions about pretty much anything. Just ask me anything. God damn it. <laughs> what is happening? What is my emails? Oh, it's a Travis. Okay. Right. Uh, meanwhile, do I do I have anything more interesting to do? Uh, Travis CI. Redeemed highlight. What? What is what is this redeemed highlight my message? What? What does this mean? <laughs> Tra yeah, I mean, I have the Travis. Uh, anyway, just I twitch doing something I don't understand anyway. So I have Travis set up for a BXJS weekly repo that makes sure that first of all, I write the correct uh, markdown. And second of all, it uh, makes sure I don't include duplicate links. So I just changed the um, link here to anchor FM and it basically rerun the whole thing to, um, no, not the actions. It should be in the, in the thing. It's a channel points thing for Twitch. Oh, okay. I've, I've seen them add that, but I have no idea what is this and how it works. But uh, thank you for telling me. I probably should read about what Twitch does. Um, ta -da -da, Twitch, yes. What is this? Channel points guide. Meanwhile, uh, again, you know, feel free to ask your questions. I'm just gonna try to figure out what the hell is channel points and how does it work and what do I do with that? Uh, channel points. Reward members of community with perks. Okay, 
sure. I um uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, why not? Sixty points. What is Hey, get started. Highlight my message. Oh, I see. Okay, this is how it works. Okay, good to know. <laughs> well, thank you again. Thank you for explaining this to me. I feel like I'm a very old man right now and I don't, don't understand what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Um. Anyway, guys, any more questions or, you know, things you want to ask about learning JavaScript, about work or whatever? If I'm not work, you work in a university professor. Uh, why did you pick this kind of job over regular software engineering? Uh, well, I'm not professor, so I'm just a scientific uh, researcher, or I guess scientific engineer at this point because I've I've not been doing research for quite some time. Uh, why did I pick it? Well, I'm so here's the deal. I've been I've tried working at the enterprise, and I've been working as a consultant for quite some time. Uh, I like the university work because it's really flexible and because I get to solve problems that are a lot more interesting than what you typically get in enterprise, right? So I worked in enterprise for a few years and the thing there is that you come in, you start building a new project, you finish it, and then it goes into maintenance mode and majority of time it's extremely boring. Right, so you get into uh, spots unless you are working on a project that evolves constantly, like in startups, for example. Right, this is like one of the areas that I'm interested in, in startups, and I did per like work for three or four different startups that had funding, and then like the same amount probably without money that would try to build something. It is a lot more interesting because you always have to change the product, you always have to evolve it, you you always have to figure out what the customers actually want, right? Well, while in enterprise, you just end up like, yes, they do pay a lot more money. Like if I would go and work for a company, I would earn, I don't know, two times more than what I have right now in university, but I would probably die from boredom, right? And university, first of all, I work remotely. So this is, I guess this is a perk of our research group. We are very, we're quite distributed. So, you know, we're allowed to work from anywhere we want. I can work from home. This is kind of great. And uh, second of all, I just get to work on really cool problems. And <coughs> apologies. And I can basically pick my own things. So there you go. Uh, Ember Code, where are you from? I like I am from Russia, but I'm currently living in Germany. Uh, so I've been living here for the past, I don't know, eight years, nine years. I did my PhD here and now working in the uh, university as a senior researcher, I guess research engineer, as I said, you know, because I'm mostly building things that are supplementary to our uh, research guys. Congrats on hundreds installments. Uh, literally, I started watching your first video a couple of days ago. Um, thank you very much. I, I really, really happy to hear that you enjoy my stuff. I'm, you know, here's to a hundred episodes more hoping that I will continue doing this. And I've been, I, I have I have a confession basically. <laughs> so I've been thinking about doing the entry-level JavaScript course for about two years now, I think, if not more. And I have a few episodes already written down as a script on paper, but I've been delaying recording them for some reason for like past half a year. And I think I just need to sit down and record that because it feels like there's a lot of people who would want to, you know, see something like this and a lot of people who would maybe align with my mental model towards programming in JavaScript, but I just, I'm just so bad at that. <laughs> but anyway, you know, guys, it's, it's always awesome to hear your kind words, your words of encouragement, because this is what keeps me going. It's like, yeah, so thank you very much for watching. And uh, yeah, can you say something in Russian? Uh, Does that, that sound good enough? Yeah, uh, if this case, do you understand Russian? Or, or did you learn Russian somewhere? It's like <laughs> German. Yeah, I can a bit of Deutsch, but not so good. My German is, is completely terrible. Hey, not a number is a number, Ukraine. Okay, cool. Uh, I mean, like, it seems like the, the, uh, the viewers is, is pretty, 
the people who watch me essentially is very diverse. And there's like a lot of people from different countries, which is again, super awesome. I also feel really embarrassing for speaking my awful German and Russian on stream for some reason. I don't know why. I'm just too used to speaking English at this point. Like I've been using English as my primary language for the past nine years since I moved to Germany. And it's just speak JavaScript. <laughs> I, that's the best one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to speak JavaScript from now, from now on. I have to think, can you actually do that? Like, can you actually literally speak Java? I don't think that will be efficient communication verbally, but uh, even in German, you speak English. Yes. Uh, like, the, so the thing is that I am working in academia, right? So this is like the uh, academia, universities, companies that work with researchers, all the grants we write, all the proposals like for funding and stuff like this, they are all, okay, not all, but like 90% are in English. And all academia publishes papers in English. So you, you kind of, all the people who work have to do English anyway. And 90% of stuff is done in English. Like, yeah, there's, you know, people like, you know, if you go to the secretary in university, she will not speak English. So you have to speak in German. But this is like every small talk and everyday things I can handle in German, but I still feel incredibly embarrassed every time I speak <laughs> for some reason. Like, I know I have to learn it more. I know I have to improve it, but yeah, it's like. <laughs> uh, looks like you're a polyglot, three languages. I mean, I wouldn't call it a good level. I'm I, I, I like, obviously Russian is my native language, so it's pretty good. English is something that I've been using for the past like 20 years or whatever. Uh, I mean, okay, 10 years daily and then 10 more on and off. So it's okay-ish. And then German is, well, I'm getting there. It's it's still not, you know, not very good. I can do everyday stuff on it. Uh, you know, small talk, go talk to officials, go talk to resolve some questions, get some help, whatever. But casually speaking in it is really hard. So I, like, I have to, I have to basically do the mental. So it has to be like significant mental effort essentially to speak German. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's not very good. It's still not very good. Like I learned it myself. So most of the uh, most of my German grammar is absolutely broken. And my friends constantly fix me whenever I try to try to speak German. <laughs> but yes, ki kind of two and a half languages. Let's put it this way. <laughs> All right, guys, any more questions or things you want to know about me about whatever? Uh, what about programming? Uh, pro <laughs> Programming language, like Siri, <laughs> you just broke my brain, man. Programming languages. Um, that is so. Let's just uh, programming. Let's just open the list and have a look at what I did not work with. I would. I, I mean, you know, if you don't take like really obscure ones, is there like a list of programming languages somewhere? Um, b -b 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 discussion, abstractions, history of programming languages. Okay, I need a list of programming languages list of programming languages oh uh, there we go okay so let's see uh a sharp no idea what this okay th th yeah okay that is a lot more than i uh know but okay i did action script so i used to work with adobe flash adobe air and stuff like this for a few years so I'm, i was pretty good at action script and i actually found javascript to be very similar to it actually typescript looks a lot like action script <laughs> um let's see what is their algol i remember doing algol in school when i was like i don't know ninth grade or something we had some random classes about that but i honestly like you know at this point i couldn't say i worked with it it's just like it was a thing <laughs> um basic obviously so we had basic in school we had basic in university uh did like you know basic charts graphics drawing stuff still remember that bash but you know it's not really a programming language like bash scripting is is easy uh c c plus plus something i had in university probably don't remember most of it but you know if 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 i would need to i would probably can code something still have problems with memory allocation and stuff like this uh have worked with c sharp for about three years on uh mostly mobile apps using the mono touch and uh what was it oh, it's called xamarin now um let's see da, 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 what is here blah 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 no i don't know any of those uh coffee scripts yeah i used to 
used to write some coffee script at some point um quite happy it's dead now because it had too many edge cases tried lisp just to see uh how it looks uh you know wouldn't call it know it but i tried it uh tried darts didn't like it um let's see what is here no no nothing on d uh, well ecmascript you know javascript all that stuff that's obviously tried elm again didn't like it uh did code a bit with elixir so i played around with it really like it like the erlang vm is a very unique thing and elixir makes it easy to work with it so i tried erlang as well and it was really hard elixir on the other hand is really really easy to work with and it's like the using erlang vm allows you to do some really cool things um yeah so erlang is already said um don't see anything else here so f sharp i've seen it it looks really interesting but i've never tried it but i would actually love to dive into that like for some reason dotnet ecosystem looks really really cool for me and uh i would yeah would want to work more with it i guess but you know javascript is my like like my 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 favorite language um let's see game maker language doubled a bit with it go go is great so i you know a couple of years coding microservices and things like this and go it's it's a pretty nice little language um personally after trying rust i think rust is is better uh and you know obviously if you don't care about garbage collection much it's, it's also fine but yeah it's it's a pretty neat little language um let's see Haskell, as I said, I've tried Haskell. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's too functional, program, like too much functional programming for me. Very, very academic, um, not a fan, but you know, it's a very, very nice and strict language. Let's put it this way. Da -da -da, let me see, J uh, Java, obviously, yeah. So I, I used, to, like, I still write Java from time to time because a bunch of our projects is in Java and sometimes I have to, you know, do things with them. I uh, prefer the, what's the new one from uh, JetBrain guys? Man, I forgot the name of it. Uh, not, not, what's the name of it? Uh, God damn it. The new for JVM, Kotlin. There you go. Uh, so prefer Kotlin over Java, which is great. Uh, yes, exactly. Kotlin. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Kotlin, as I already said, uh, basically, if I need to use JVM, some Java project, and I don't have to write Java, this is what I will use. Uh, very nice language, very, like, very, very similar to JavaScript, actually, in my opinion, uh, in, in terms of flexibility. Um, da -da -da, let's see. So I don't think I've tried anything from this list. Oh, yeah, I've tried Lua a bit. So I did some scripts on Lua for the uh, World of Warcraft, for the, like, the add-ons, because they're written in Lua. It's uh, quite easy to write. So it's a nice little language. Uh, M, is there anything here? M more try? I don't even like half of those languages are so obscure. I never even heard about that. <laughs> uh, MathLab, yes. MathLab and Mathematica. Those are two we had in the university um, when I was doing like the, um, you know, because my, my first degree, so the, the uh, master science I have is in elect electrical engineering. So we used to do a lot of like schematics calculations and MathLab and Mathematica were like two tools that we used all the time. Pain in ass to use, but uh, very powerful. Um, and what do we have here? Um, MPL, no, I don't think I know any of those. I've looked at NIM, like this is one of the languages that looks really neat. As a sort of open source thing that is supposed to be like better C C plus plus, but it seems to be very niche. But I really like the way that it's written, so sort of like Ruby like, but that compiles to you know like low level bytecode, which is uh, pretty damn cool. But never tried it in any you know production projects. Um, I've looked at OCaml, was terrified, and then closed it. <laughs> This is basically all my experience here. Um, I've worked a lot with Perl when I was in school. So this was like, I think one of the first languages I actually learned. It was, you know, the whole like, um, what do you call it? CG, CG, was it CGI? No. Oh man. Um, what was the thing we had for server-side scripting before, uh, before the whole like, <laughs> CGI, yeah, okay, it was CGI scripting, okay, yeah. So common gateway interfaces and all that stuff, uh, Perl for that, uh, PHP after that. So I used to work with PHP for five years or so, so quite a lot of that. 
Uh, Python, obviously, still doing a lot of Python these days as well, because again, you know, data science and everything goes quite a lot with Python. Uh, I mean, Qt script kinda, mostly worked with Qt from the C, C++ site. Um, our Rust, yeah, so this is something that I've been diving into lately, mostly because of the Deno. Uh, pretty nice language, again, a lot of confusing things that are quite alien to me because I'm not a C developer, but I'm trying to learn them and uh, so far it's been great. Ruby, I've been, I've actually written my, my thesis uh, for the uh, Master Science in Ruby. So it was like remote learning system. Uh, it was, I mean, Ruby is a nice language. It's pretty good. Um, let's see, S, is there anything I've used on S? I don't think so actually. I mean, Scala, yeah, okay. I kind of doubled in Scala, but couldn't really say I used that. Swift, I've written one tiny app in Swift. It's a lot nicer than, oh yeah, Objective-C. I don't think we, we did we had it already? Um, so Objective-C was a pain in the ass to write. Like I've written apps for iPhones when they just came out. It was painful as hell. Swift is a really nice step up. SQL, well, yeah, that's true. SQL is something I still use quite frequently. Uh, let's see, T, what do we have? TypeScript, um, again, I'm still not, you know, with Deno make it a lot easier to work with TypeScript, so I maybe will switch to it, but it's still like, yeah. Uh, text is something that is used heavily in the academia. If you never heard about it, it's essentially a markup language for creating PDF files and nice, nicely formatted articles. So that's like something that I've used quite a lot. Uh, Unix shell, obviously, um, da -da -da, Visual Basic. I think I did some Visual Basic in university if I remember correctly. And WebAssembly, well, not directly, but you know, um, I think that's basically it. So I don't remember, we missed Clojure somehow because I used Clojure as well. But yeah, so this is kind of the gist of what I used. Uh, most of that I did use in production one shape or another. Uh, yes, I did look at Clojure. I actually used Clojure for, you know, to build a couple of pretty big Java projects uh, that we use internally. Uh, I, I specifically picked it up to learn functional programming because it's purely functional. And this is what kind of made the functional programming click for me because there is, so the closure is very strict in regards to, you know, being functional, right? And there are some things that's really hard to build in purely functional way unless you knew what it, you know exactly how to do that. So it actually reshaped the way I think about code quite a bit when I finished the first project using it. So I would, uh, I, you know, I, I think I already said it more than once, but if you are interested in functional programming, pick one language that is purely functional and just try to build something even small in it you will see how different it is from just doing it in a, you know, imperative way, essentially. Okay, let me have a look at the questions here. Just started programming about six months ago. I've been in the tech industry for about 10 years. There are many learn JavaScript courses. I found JavaScript understanding the weird part better than most. Having someone who can explain the deep intricacies is helpful. I, for one, would really like to learn more about the hooks. I'm currently finishing up the Redux projects. I mean, the idea of the hooks is, is, is again, it's, you know, it's not something, it's essentially kind of derived from functional programming. So the side effects and everything, right? So hooks are the side effects that you call from your React components, which is pure functions, which should not mutate anything. But this, it's like, you know, you, you just, what, what, how would I put that in a mental model? So the way I think about it is that, when React renders a component, it creates this global React state, right? And when you use hooks, they essentially change that global state in some way, be it setting the state, be it calling the effect whenever something happens on a global level, or be it, I don't know, like what, what are the React hooks? I don't remember other hooks because I don't remember anything. Uh, so there is state effects, hooks API. Uh, context, yeah, so the same, you basically, you have this global thing and then you can access it from any other component. So this is kind of how I keep it, like this is how it works in my head at least, right? I don't know if that helps or maybe confuses you even more, but uh, this is how, the way I usually think about that. 
Okay, let's see. Deno question. How can I trust third party code? Say example, Oak framework. What the guarantee that they won't delete the rep or break, remove the existing tagged Git versions, any central hosted NPM? Uh, so here's the thing. How can you trust NPM code, right? It's the same problem. And uh, with Node.js, you don't really have any other choice. You can npm install and then you can use it. And the way that it works typically within the enterprises, right? If you, uh, if you use third party code from npm, you usually have a local registry that mirrors the packages that you want. And if you care about security a lot, you have a team that basically vetoes the version and says, okay, we can now use this because we went through a source code and there's nothing malicious and we can use it, right? Now with Deno, it's actually a lot easier because for example, uh, first of all, if they delete repo or if they change tagging or whatever, it will actually invalidate your cache. So you will see that, you know, okay, your code started pulling something new. So something must have changed. So you can actually recheck it because you have the local cache anyway, right? Uh, and second of all, Deno has the security abstraction integrated by default. So even if the code says, so you say we use Oak to create a, I don't know, web server, right? And then you run it and then it suddenly tries to access your password file, it will fail because you did not give it permission to access files, right? Um, I like, yeah, so this is kind of the gist. At least non log deleted old versions and PM. Uh, well, NPM actually allows you to delete the versions. It does not allow you to republish them. I don't think you like, so basically the thing is that you should, uh, how do you put it? So basically the thing is, unless the URL changes, then it will not repool it, right? So if you have it cached, it's gonna be perfectly fine. Um, there's about 30 second delay. Did I, I thought I have the low latency setting enabled. Wait a second, let me just have a quick look. It is stream. Um, I think I had the, I guess maybe it's the Twitch change something, but I believe I had the low latency enabled. But uh, yeah, anyway. So the thing is, yes, NPM doesn't really allow you to delete old versions if there are specific conditions fulfilled. But if you are using Deno and you, uh, like you pull from GitHub, for example, there's no way like you can delete the old version, right? Because you can just nuke the repo, but there's like, it's really hard to essentially screw it, screw with the version rather than in Node.js because in Node.js you can just publish a new version that is like a patch or something that includes the malicious code. This is what happened numerous times, right? And there's no way to know that there is now a malicious code because it's a patch and your NPM install will actually install it by default because all the default npm install the way it saves is not exact version but actually the you know the semver compatibility so all, everything that is minor and patch will be installed so deno in this case is a lot safer um okay will deno replace node as i already said maybe it will but not in the next five ten years so it's, it's far from that uh, okay da -da -da, let me have a look at the uh question yeah so that was it NPM faults have been working on security layer. I mean, yeah, obviously there's a lot of work, but the way that Node.js built is just not something that you can solve as easy, right? So then I think one of the strongest points of Deno is the promise of this security, right? Because if you create a web server that just sends, I don't know, some JSON response that doesn't need access to files, then you don't have to give it allow read flag so it won't access your password file, right? And this is a lot more powerful than just trusting some, basically in this case, you, you have to trust NPM as a company that they will protect you, right? Which is, uh, again, you know, from my experience, if we're talking enterprises, they will never do that. Like if you are a serious enterprise, like a bank or whatever, you have your own team who pulls dependencies, puts them in your local registry, and then, um, what do you call it? Audits them, right? So you get the audits and figure out if it's malicious or not. And if it's not malicious, it's green lighted and then developers can update it. Um, there was an article recently in, in one of the episodes um, that basically the, um, da -da -da, uh, the, um, 
research from, I think it was Cloudflare or something, uh, the JavaScript dependencies, yeah, there you go, there it is, it was a previous episode, the JavaScript libraries are almost never updated once installed. Like this is a perfect example of uh, of using the code, right? You very like if you are not, I don't know, some open source, constantly supported library, you just install it once and you never care about it as long as it works, right? Especially in the large like internal tools, enterprises, whatever. It works, don't touch it, right? This is <laughs> this is usually how it goes. And with regards to Deno, it's going to be a lot more practical because not just not only will Deno use the URLs, but you can also do the Deno bundle and get the resulting bundle that you can then publish. And that's like that's it's just a lot um, makes a lot more sense to me at least, right? So this kind of security model, because yes, there's always going to be attack vectors. Yes, there's always going to be issues with things breaking, things, you know, someone trying to act malicious, but at least Deno gives you more ways of protect, uh, protecting yourself is what I'm trying to say. All right. Any more questions or suggestions or, I don't know, things you want to talk about? Firefox? Why? What do you mean Firefox? I don't, what, what do you mean Firefox? Why? I need, I need more explanation. That is not Firefox. This is Adobe Edge uh, version 80. Uh, I have tried using Firefox as my primary driver for the past three months. While most of the time it works fine, there is a few bugs, like really minor bugs that were related to my workflows that are got so annoying, I essentially dropped it. Uh, I really like Chrome. Uh, I really don't like what Google does with it, but actually the uh, Microsoft Edge seems to be the perfect browser so far. Like the only thing that I'm missing right now is this history, open tabs, extensions, and collection syncing. And once they integrate that, I'll just switch to it on all my devices because so far on Windows, it's been working freaking amazing. Like this is just a lot faster than Chrome, a lot snappier than Chrome, um, you know, has nice... Uh, Super nice features like the collections, for example, are really cool. And you can install apps on your desktop and they behave like a native apps, uh, which again, Chrome kind of does this, but not as good as uh, Edge, at least on Windows, which is uh, kind of cool. How hard it was to move to Germany. I'm thinking about getting a bachelor degree in Germany because Ukrainian technical universities suck. Um, well, I moved here when I just graduated from university. So I didn't really have, you know, any anything weighing me down. I was living with parents. I didn't have much stuff. So essentially I moved here with like a backpack of stuff. <laughs> that was not very hard. <laughs> it was a bit stressful at first because it was like pretty terrifying. Um, you know, being alone in a new country. I don't know anyone, but the professor who essentially invited me to study here and uh it was scary as hell but it wasn't hard so it was just like very confusing very weird because new culture new country new rules new ways of things for you know the way the people behave the way they do things uh it was it was just yeah strange but i wouldn't say hard uh, which city in Germany? Uh, I'm currently living in Leipzig. Uh, no, not Berlin. Berlin is, I mean, it's not too far away, but uh, I am in Leipzig and I finished the University of Leipzig and this is where I'm working right now, uh, which might change soonish, but uh, we're going to see how that develops. Uh, I've been to Berlin more than a few times. It's a pretty neat city and maybe we'll move there at one point. But for now, actually, Leipzig seems like a really nice place to be. Like it's sort of, um, you know, Berlin got very mainstream lately and Leipzig feels like a very hipster version of Berlin at this point. Not saying like the Berlin itself is a very hipster city, but you know. Um, yeah, but yeah, there you go. Um, any more questions or, you know, things you want to ask and uh, talk about? What is this? Let me just check the email. We got some... Uh, of course, of course, someone is working today. <laughs> All right, so any other questions or, you know, things you want to ask about JavaScript, uh, I don't know, Germany, moving to another country, studying in another country, working in another country, whatever. Could you suggest any good technical universities in German? Um, I would basically... So the thing is that uh, universities in Germany are... Or, like, I, I guess rather my experience is that they have 
specializations, right? So each university has different faculties, obviously, right? But the faculties would have different research areas and they would have different strengths. And what I did when I applied for my PhD is I looked at the profiles uh, of those. So the way that the uh, German universities are structured, uh, let me see, so University Leipzig. Um, so the, the, uh, the way the universities works in Germany is slightly different from like Russia and Ukraine. And I guess majority of other countries actually, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, at least, you know, it's different from Russia and Ukraine. So the way it works is that you have the university as this overall organization, but then you get faculties and institutes that are kind of a standalone things that are almost independent from the university itself, right? So you get the faculty of mathematics and computer science here. Uh, this is like my employer right now. And um, they have subgroups. So they have these institutes, right? Which are also something that exists within the faculty. It's like Institute of Computer Science, Institute of Mathematics, and so on and so forth. They can be like up to, I don't know, I've seen, I think I've seen like five to 10 of those. And then within institute, you got a bunch of groups that focus on specific things. So like we have uh, our group that does the semantic web. We have people who do like distributed computing. We got people who do like databases and all of them teach different things. <laughs> Uh, Russian universities are good in IT. Um, I, I mean, that's highly depends. There are some good ones, but I honestly, at this moment, I don't know how it works. Because even when I was studying, which was like 2000, what was it? 2009, right? When I graduated. Already back then, there was quite a lot of problems with uh, good teachers because the only ones teaching were like, you know, this... The grandpas who was like 80 something years old and they were basically not doing this for money but doing this because this is what they did for the whole life and there was not that many young teachers so i don't know what the situation is right now like it's it's just even even back then it was really sad but anyway coming back to the um coming back to the um universities in germany so what I would do is I would basically open, find the universities that do computer science, find the institutes they have, and then look at the groups and what kind of specializations they have. Find the ones that you like most and apply to those. Because this is like, this, this is the highest, you know, this is the best chance to find something that sounds interesting to you because there could be, like, it could be still the, you know, Institute for Computer Science, but they could be completely, completely different focuses in like two different universities. So just find the ones that work on what do you think uh, is interesting to you? Like, I don't know, functional programming or distributed systems or databases, or I don't know, semantic web or whatever, and apply there. Uh, I guess this would be my advice, uh, at least for Germany, you know, I I'm not sure how the uh, universities work in other European countries, but uh, this is, yeah, this is basically what I would say for Germany. Okay, um, any other questions or, you know, things you want to know, discuss, uh, ask, just throw them in, basically. I guess we're good. Oh, what? What? No. <laughs> My phone just turned on Siri for some reason. God damn it. Okay, then. Okay, meanwhile, I should, yeah, I should update the cast box here as well. Um, might as well do it right now. Um, to, 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 um, so I think we need a website. Yeah. So meanwhile, you guys, you know, think about the questions. I'm going to go ahead and update the website, which I haven't done in years. Uh, I need to edit the page, the index page actually. And I need to change. I need to change. What? Why are you not scrolling? Come on now. Uh, I need to change the cast box. Uh, this Anchor FM is my new favorite platform. It's actually a lot nicer than CastBox. So if you're doing podcasts, consider going to the Anchor FM because they automatically distribute your stuff to all other um, platforms, which is uh, quite damn nice. Okay. 
um, replace cast box with anchor FM. Right. So it seems like there's no more questions. Am I getting this correct? Uh, are we are we done for today? No, no, nothing else. Like you know, this might as well be a good spot to wrap it up. I'm uh, getting quite quite damn hungry here, to be honest. <laughs> Need to go eat something. Okay, let me just create a pull request. Uh, I guess that's it. it yes, seems so. Okay, I mean, uh, so basically, I'm just gonna you know finish with this pull request. Meanwhile, if you guys have any other questions or things you want to ask, just throw them into the chat. If not, then once the pull request is merged, I'm just um, gonna stop this here and go do something. Um, again, as I said, I got my hands on the Dead Cells Bed Seed update uh, prior to its release. So this is the thing that is going to be coming out in, I think, next week or something. February 11th. Yeah, there you go. So I got it a bit early. So I'm going to be streaming this in, I don't know, either today or tomorrow evening. And uh, yeah, so if you like video games, then do come and join. Uh, and uh, yes, it was indeed a pleasure. So it's, 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 I think I should do AMA more because it's kind of fun to just sit here and chat with you guys. Uh, it's called Dead Cells and it is really, really cool. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a really, really awesome uh, Metroidvania slash, um, what do you call it, uh, roguelite. Roguevania, as they call it, yeah. So it's like the I played it when it was in early access. It was bonkers, and I I only beat the first boss, I think. And since then, they've released like a ton of free updates, and now they're releasing the paid DLC, which is coming out on February 11th. And this is what I'm gonna be trying out. So if that sounds interesting, do join me. I guess later today. That's probably gonna work. Right, merge pull requests. And uh, we are basically done. All right, doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. So uh, yeah, thank you guys very much for joining me. Thank you for all your questions. Once again, thank you for your support. I would not be here without you. Um, as usual, you know, you can find the VOD for this on Twitch immediately or on YouTube after a few hours. You can come and join our Discord server to chat about stuff. Um, again, there's going to be some gaming streams this weekend, either today or tomorrow. Thank you very much for watching, and I see you next time. Bye.